Sí, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos al último panel de este primer día del octavo coloquio sobre la diversidad cultural en el Caribe, eh, cuyo tema fundamental es resiliencia y creación en escenarios de pandemia. Eh, voy a hablar en inglés para, bueno, eh, invitar a los eh, principales presentadores hoy y, bueno, van a tener la eh, traducción en línea. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, to, good afternoon, first. Welcome to Casa las Americas and this last panel today. Uh, the title of this panel is Creation and Environmental Activism. And I think it's interesting because these two speakers came from different angles and different fields that will uh, gather a different point of view among, oh, on the subject of how human kind and nature uh, interact and mostly how we can uh, create uh, new ways uh, that also uh, resemblance from the historical point of view of how we in Caribbean island has been facing the climate change and how it affects us in a way. So first, um, we have the presentation title Offshore Imaginations and Reframing Ecological Narrative Through Photography by Nadia Huggins, which is uh, a visual artist uh, na uh, born in um, Trinidad Tobago, Tobago and living in St. Vincent and Grenadines. She's a designer by profession, but a self-top uh, photographer. And she will share with us part of his, her work that has a lot of to do with this um, connection that every Islander has with not only the sea, the landscape, and also how these Islander's behaviors uh, create a sense of unity with uh, the place in which we are located, which is the Caribbean area or a Caribbean island as well the uniqueness of this relationship and in a few moments she will share with us uh, her point of view about that also i want you to know that she uh, besides of being uh, several years uh, in the caribbean area and also north america uh, united states and toronto and in canada also uh, she was part of the foundation of a magazine arc magazine and also has initiative that is one drop of war one drop one drop in the ocean which is an initiative that aims to raise awareness about um, marine debris. On the second part of this panel, we will have later on, um, as a second speaker, Alexander Girva, which is um, an independent ec environmental economist, uh, also uh, with a presentation titled Understanding local values as a pathway to environmental conflict and resolution, resolutions. Um, besides of being a, a, an independent consultant, uh, environmental consultant, also he, he has been a professor, and most of his um, um, articles and researches has been published and presented in different venues, all area in Caribbean, uh, different countries and organizations has been. Um, in relation with him, uh, such as the Association of uh, Caribbean States and also as a consultant for different NGOs and um, institutions such as, um, sorry, um, United Nations Conference of Trade and Development, UNTAD. Uh, without any other um, information I will give you first Nadia Huggins, then later on uh, Alexander Gripen. Nadia? Yes. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, it's really wonderful as well to just be in conversation with Alex. I mean, the both of us have been speaking for a number of years, even in our different capacities. So it's nice to, to finally be in a panel with him to, to be able to have these discussions. Um, I'm going to have to let Alex share my screen, well, share his screen to do my presentation, so just bear with me a moment. Thanks. Um, so, as was said previously, I'm a visual artist. Um, I work primarily in photography, uh, and my practice sort of moves between, uh, you know, documentary and conceptual. And a lot of my work is sort of focused around the environment, which is not necessarily 
it, it didn't start off as an intentional thing, but it's sort of like become um, the framework for a lot of the images that I create. So I sort of move between the land and the sea, um, and my work is very, very sort of interested in ideas surrounding belonging and identity and um, understanding a sense of place within the Car within the Caribbean context. Next slide, please, Alex. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start off with a body of work that is sort of sort um, set a foundation for everything that I've been creating moving forward. Um, this series is called Circle No Future, and I started developing it in 2014 when I first when I got my first underwater camera. And the images focus on a group of young black adolescent boys that you know, very typical scenes that we see in the Caribbean of young boys jumping off of like rocks or jetties or boats. Um, but it, it's very interested in that moment where the performance ends after they jump from, from whatever rock or boat they're on and um, that transformation that happens with the body as they um, go through the surface of the ocean. Next slide please, Alex. Um, so this is a sort of very performative moment, um, referencing this idea of them, you know, performing their masculinity in that sense. Um, but what I became really interested in is that sort of um, return to a state of vulnerability, a kind of a expression of humanness that we don't get to see so much on land, um, because we, you know, on land we're kind of moving within so certain social constructs and this, so. Uh, performing certain roles in terms of like class and race and gender, um, sexuality, whatever whatever these you know constructs might be, um, but really sort of showing the human body in a space um, where it's not necessarily meant to be, you know, but it's, um, it, it it shows a type of expression in this space that you might not get to see on the land. Next slide, please. So, yeah, this is a kind of a moment underwater, and there, I have several images in this series that focuses on different aspects, and um, it really kind of, it, it plays a lot with like, the anonymity of the body as well, like, you know, none of the images, you can easily identify who the person is, so you can sort of see something of yourself in the image as well, and that's a very intentional thing that I do in a lot of my images, because I'm trying to also identify um, a universality in people in my images. So I, I'm, I'm very particular about trying to maintain a certain sense of anonymity in the images. Next slide, please. So simultaneously, while, while I've been shooting these images of the young boys, I've also been sort of like turning the lens on myself. Um, and I started off actually documenting a lot of marine life um, on the beach that I grew up on. So looking at different types of coral, rocks, you know, sea urchins, anything that struck my interest at the time. Um, while also photographing myself, and I, I sort of stumbled across this like, unusual um, image of like, you know, pairing my body with, with these marine organisms. And, you know, the kind of thinking behind this, you know, there's a, I mean, obviously in the Caribbean, we have a culture of carnival, this idea of like masking ourselves. And I was really sort of interested in showing these two different realities, almost coming together, um, but not quite existing together, because obviously as a human, we can't exist in the sea, um, and marine life can't exist above water. So there's a kind of a tension that exists between the images um, that's very intentional in the work in these in these particular images. You can switch the next slide, Alex. So this there's eleven images in total in the series, um, and again, like it just focuses on different sort of marine organisms um, that I have been documenting over a span of three to four years, um, and. I mean, as I go on, you'll understand the kind of, <laughs> the, the repetitiveness of, of this sort of documentation sort of became really important uh, in some of the environmental activism work that I had kind of just organically stumbled into in recent years. Um, 
but initially when I had started off building this project, you know, it, was, it, was a, it was a conceptual um, body of work um, that I was trying to just relate to a certain type of concept. I wasn't particularly thinking about climate change in a greater sense, but obviously, you know, because I'm documenting marine life over a span of time, you do sort of see different changes happening. Um, but, you know, narrowed down to the 11 images, that, that would not have been um, so clear at the time. Let's switch to the next slide. So, um, you know, again, now thinking about the environmental activism aspect of what I do, um, because I had, you know, this sort of really detailed documentation of this beach that I was swimming in, you know, um, from people to life to just sort of abstract moments underwater, um, I realized I had just sort of built this body of work that I didn't realize at the time would have come in really useful, but there was a development, a hotel development um, happening on this beach and the developers had proposed basically ripping out a live coral reef um, to, you know, bring in sand and sort of make it a very um, separate spot for tourists um, to enjoy and just like not really thinking so much about the community. And in the environmental um, assessments that they did, they they had claimed that this reef was dead when I had obviously had, you know, very different evidence to prove this. Um, so of course, like I couldn't just sort of sit back and, and, and look at it happen. I mean, it's one, my home, it's literally my backyard. And um, I, I, I just wanted to share the images with the public to help them to understand what had been happening and why this assessment was wrong. Um, you know, so I, I sent in, um, my, my refusal letter um, to the planning department and, you know, with very detailed information about the time that, you know, the end of the shot depth and thinking about the, you know, the location, you know, luckily I had very detailed um, metadata on the camera stating exactly where I had photographed everything. So, um, you know, and at the time when I was thinking of doing this sort of like body of work as an artist, that made something very conceptual. I wasn't envisioning this happening, um, so it became it became pretty intrinsic in like building a you know an online campaign to help educate people and let them know this was what was happening. You can switch your next slide, Alex. So um, this is you know at you know the tail end of things. About like six months later, we managed to to get the application rejected, um, which was tremendous because, you know, we were able to mobilize a lot of people on the island and outside of the island, that, you know, I didn't realize that people were so passionate um, about the environment in St. Vincent. Um, so it was really heartwarming to see so many people just sort of show up and, and um, really, you know, really just kind of like, give their, their um, thoughts and, and everything on, on this issue. So that was that was a sort of tremendous, tremendous moment as an artist and just like this way that again, I've just like organically stumbled into doing activism work. Can you switch to the next slide? Um, so, you know, again, like, I mean, a lot of what I do is very observational um, and it's hard to, separate yourself from the environment. I mean, you know, as an artist, you always can come out to like show something beautiful. Um, but the reality of what's happening is always so different, right? Mm -hmm. And now, um, you know, just thinking of all of these like changes that are happening on our shorelines, um, you know, like looking at like the, the influx of sargassum coming in. Again, like something I've been documenting for the last five years. Um, and showing sort of different aspects of it, looking at it from the shore, looking at it from the sea, looking at it from above, looking at it from underneath, looking at it close, you know. So really showing that like um, scale of, of the issue, but like um, trying to, you know, I, I think it's important as the like, creator to be able to give a kind of a, a multi-perspective on what's happening, you know, like a lot of people only have that relationship with a situation like this, for example, from the shoreline, they'll be looking out and they'll just kind of see the sargassum coming in. But 
it really helps to have that like understanding of what is happening from from different perspectives. Let's we'll switch to the next slide. So again, this is the kind of a more um, a different way of kind of looking at at the issue and and, and trying to relate a certain kind of emotion um, behind these changes happening. Next slide. Um, another project. Well, again, you know, life just kind of unfolds in its own way, and I think I mean obviously this happens with the environment as well. Um, so St. Vincent uh, went through a volcanic eruption last year um, during the month of April and I had been doing a lot of work with the Seismic Research Center leading up to this, you know, just kind of educating people on the hazards and, and what to expect when this eruption happened. We knew, we knew it was going to happen at some point but we didn't quite know when um, and just again it's kind of a timely manner. Um, it started to explode um, in April. Uh, and obviously, you know, in that situation, I just kind of put myself into action and started documenting things. But, you know, looking at the way disasters have been documented in the Caribbean, um, you know, there's, there's a kind of a way that seems very exploitative. Um, it doesn't really show the full scope of what's happening. I mean, yes, we know that people suffer, we know that there's, you know, a lot of displacement. We, we understand that these things happen and you know those things are important to highlight and to deal with but then there's also this whole other a nuanced kind of aspect um, to what happens during a disaster and for me I wanted to be able to sort of show that from a more personal point of view um, you know because I mean we were all kind of having very different experiences during this um, eruption they're the people who live in the red zones, who are much more vulnerable in the space, and then the people like me who live in more privileged, privileged spaces, and you know, in terms of the green zone, and not that greatly affected, but still, still having to deal with the trauma and um, the unfolding of, of this catastrophe. Next slide. So this, um, for example, is you know, just kind of shows. Um, the amount of ash that was um, in the red zone in some areas. And again, you know, like looking at sort of nuanced things, so the ash in the red zone would have been, you know, much greater in particle size compared to the ash in the green zone. So, you know, showing showing that kind of disparity between experiences and really um, building an archive for future generations to reference and understand what to expect in another eruption, which will happen. Um, so really kind of thinking of it in a, in, in a futuristic sense. Next slide, please. Am I doing okay for time? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, this, you know, uh, looking at sort of like cliche images of the Caribbean, and I think, you know, it's like, Islands that depend on tourism um, to sustain our economies. You know, the palm tree is sort of like this icon um, of tourism, for instance. And, you know, being in the midst of a, a catastrophe and sort of seeing things unfold, you know, I, I kind of wanted to start looking at these sort of symbols um, of what we depend on to sustain our livelihood. And, um, you know, I, I went for a drive. Into the, into the red zone and the amount of ash that was just kind of circulating. I mean, this is one image, for example, um, that was just like clouded in ash and it just kind of like subverted this idea of what, you know, the cliche Caribbean was. Um, and I think a lot of my work is about that, like trying to look at things that are very typical, um, things that we take for granted in the image and um, trying to show a different side to things. Go to the next slide. Um, so just to kind of, I mean, you know, wrapping it up a bit, thinking about natural disasters and uh, think, you know, like experiences that sort of tie the Caribbean together. Um, I, I recently did a residency in Haiti in December, um, you know, and it, it was a UNESCO-funded project um, and an exchange between. Haitian artists and Trinidadian artists, and they want to work with primarily women. And, you know, I had obviously just wanted this experience of a volcanic eruption, and 
the area that I was going into in Haiti was Jacna, where they had the major earthquake um, some years ago. And, you know, it's like trying to think of like things that connect us um, in the region. How do I tell stories in a way that is not exploitative? You know, I mean, Haiti has a very um, particular narrative of images coming out of it, you know. You know, we, we see the poverty, we see the disaster porn, you know, we don't, we don't really get to dive deeper into what's actually happening visually. So it's a very challenging space as a photographer to work in. Um, but I had, you know, again, thinking about the images I had created with the coral and sort of looking at that dichotomy between the land, the sea and the body. Um, I started thinking about that in the context of Haiti, like, you know, working with these sort of landscapes, you know, because I was in a very mountainous area. Um, and obviously the thing that was going through my mind was sort of like earthquakes and like thinking of the landscape shifting, thinking of that kind of tectonic movement of the earth, which is what, you know, which is what has like kind of geologically created the Caribbean in that sense. So, um, you know, playing these images sort of sliding past each other, um, sort of becoming one um, and, and referencing again the body to, to, show, to show this tension between these two worlds trying to coexist. You can switch to the next slide, Alex. Um, yeah, so, you know, like, working with these kind of plates shifting past each other, and again, like, working with very typical um, symbols of what represents the Caribbean, you know, like banana trees, you know, mountains, coconut trees, whatever, but, um, Trying, trying to show these ideas in a more nuanced way um, and just kind of hoping that it could sort of draw people in initially to be, okay, this, this is kind of a strange image, like what's going on here, and hoping that can kind of instill more conversation um, to really kind of delve into, you know, to the issues surrounding the environment and how, um, how we can think of new ways um, to approach the future. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks to you. <laughs> thank you, Alex. <laughs> well, it's been really interesting because uh, when I first saw your images in your Instagram and then later in your website, I was also uh, amazed by the, uh, the connection that you find not only, you know, recovering those memories of you being a child and enjoying the, um, you know, the, your time in the sea, but also seeing yourself uh, reflect on how the next generation are also enjoying not only the benefits of being uh, an Islander near to the sea and also understanding that it's part of your uh, identity in a way. And also I think it's interesting in your work how you uh, maintain that conscience or rise that, that uh, awareness of how we are living here and now, but the climate change and everything, this ecological crisis that is impacting us, has a lot to do with how we reshape our, our, our ways of uh, being in our communities, in our relationship with them, and also what is ephemeral and what could be, in a way, through your photography, through your search, uh, image searching and also uh, that connection that definitely has to be uh, thought out loud, if I may say so. You know, talk more about these issues because it's, it's a way also to recognize that it's a problem not only in a political or economical situation, but mostly also cultural thing that we, we could lose a lot in this process of not understanding what is our time to be here now and facing this climate change, okay? So I believe later someone perhaps will be able to ask some questions about your work directly. But now we uh, have the second part of this panel, as I was telling you, with uh, Alexander Girvan. Um, giving you a mic open to you right now. And yes, I will read it. Yes, okay. Yeah, thank you so much for that um, introduction. Um, my name is Alexander Gervon. I'm an environmental economist working on a variety of environmental issues, primarily in um, the Caribbean and primarily in ocean space, but as well on land. Um, my presentation, let me just share my screen, give me one second. 
is on Well, it's on understanding local values as a pathway to environmental conflict resolution. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through a bit of a journey on current thinking in environmental economics. Um, some of the ways current thinking has changed, and some of the ways historical ways of thinking about nature have failed us and created a lot of environmental problems. I'm also going to talk about some ways in which we can begin to represent and understand these values, how in doing so we can hopefully begin to find solutions to environmental conflict. So as I said today, just to give you an overview, uh, speak about, I want to speak about what are these traditional concepts of value in environmental economics. I'm then going to talk about what are some of the shortcomings of these ways of thinking. And then I'm going to end by saying how else can value be expressed I'm really happy that our moderator, but also Nadia, spoke so much about relationships um, because, you know, as Caribbean people, it has a lot to do with our relationships with nature, but as well as Caribbean people, we share information and knowledge through stories. So it's how we tell stories visually, by word of mouth, through art, etc. So that's how I'm going to do. So let me just speak about you know, the three different traditional views of our relationship with the environment. Um, you have neoclassical economics, um, which really views the environment as another piece of capital. Um, environment is something that provides amenity flows or waste assimilation, and it kind of assumes what it calls weak sustainability, so that services that nature gives to us can be replicated or replaced or substituted through human-made capital. Here, the idea is that the services provided by a mangrove can be replicated a water treatment facility. So we already can begin to see, I'm sure amongst the group of the converted, why this is a little bit complicated and falls short. Um, where I operate is environmental economics, which is kind of in the middle of the modified neoclassical view. And it has some substitutability between nature and environment, but not complete substitutability. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, where we ideally want to be, is ecological economics, and that's the, the um, diagram on the right. And in ecological economics, the economy operates within a natural environment. We recognize that resources in nature are finite, and that there's really nothing in nature that can be repli replicated or replaced by human capital. So, unfortunately, in policy making and decision making, neoclassical economics and environmental economics dominate. Um, and in these viewpoints, uh, we traditionally use a concept called ecosystem services to explain the benefits humans derive from nature. So this is a very anthropocentric or human-oriented view, and it very much focuses on human benefit. So in this school of thought, we have things called provisioning services, things like fish, things like energy, things like um, fruit or timber that will take from the forest to use for uh, medication. You also have things like regulating services, which is where a macro ecosystem will prevent a storm surge or a hurricane from completely destroying, destroying a small village or a village. You also have cultural services, which is where something like a coral reef or a beach is providing special services in terms of ecotourism or recreation to local people, but also, of course, you have certain, certain aspects of the environment which have heritage or spiritual value. Now, underneath all of this theory of supporting services, things like nutrients, like cycling of nutrients and water, and minerals to our bioecological systems, and these support all of these other services. Now, this idea came up uh, about 30 or 20 years ago, in the early 2000s, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And this really began to dominate our way of thinking because it finally articulated the the, the environment is something that provides us with clear benefits from a Western standpoint. You know, there are other traditional viewpoints which recognize the importance of the environment above and beyond anything else well before this. But what was useful about this is that the Western decision making context, it proved like a very useful tool to illustrate the values we derive from the environment. But this is not the be all and I also want to say that another concept that emerged 
little bit afterwards, when I was in the last 10 to 15 years, is natural capital. And this is speaking about the environment, um, our natural asset, as a source of capital which can produce um, ecosystem goods and services, but also can help mitigate against negative impacts of, of the environment or our conditions. So in this, we can just think about the ecosystem services, which would be the flow of goods from a factory. We also think of the mangrove or the forest as a factory that provides a lot of services. So in this natural capital context, what you can ask yourself is, how is my economy dependent on natural capital or ecosystem, right? But also, how does my economy affect or impact ecosystems and natural systems, which will eventually affect interdependence? So again, this is still a relatively Western way of viewing the environment and our relationships with the environment. Now, the reason they introduced these concepts was because in theory, in this point, the reason we are failing from an environmental perspective, the reason we are encountering problems like climate change, encountering problems like pollution, encountering problems like overproduction of plastic and other negative things, it's because the benefits that we get from the environment, these ecosystems, goods and services provided to us are considered to be non-market goods. Now, what is a non-market good? In a traditional near classical view, it's basically a good that you are not paying for. If there's a coral reef in front of your um, you know, beach house, you are not paying that coral reef postal protection services. However, if you wanted to protect that artificially, you would have to pay an engineer tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to come and build a seawall to protect your coastal property, right? So fundamentally, because you're not paying for that coastal protection provided by that coral reef, you don't value it, you don't consider it in your decisions, and when you're taking actions which damage a coral reef, for example, using certain sunscreen or doing dynamite with it, you're not thinking about the eventual impact. You know, you would never throw dynamite in a wall that you built and paid for, right? If it was protecting your property, but you will throw dynamite with a coral reef because you're not thinking about these bodies because you don't pay for it, right? You don't pay for bees to pollinate for your crops, so you don't protect the bees, right? You don't pay the beach the same way you would pay a psychiatrist or a doctor for your mental health, even though when you go to the beach, you leave them to the relax. So in this viewpoint, with all the price, we make decisions thinking that these things are free. And if you imagine, if you never had to pay for car maintenance or repair, would you drive your car differently? You would probably drive it differently. So the point here is that because we're not considering all these different services for decision. Now, economic valuation, again, a very Western view, tries to put cost to all of benefits and actions. So we try to put the like value to the well-being provided by being able to see the beach. We try to put that value to the amount of fish provided by our coral reef. We try to put that value to the coastal protection provided by a mango ecosystem from storm to a large city. Right? So we try to put some value to these things so that we can, in theory, make better decisions. We can consider the cost of these non-market goods and services in our decisions, right? We have these, we have these, we have this awareness of cost and benefit of the environment of these dollar figures. Hopefully, we can use these figures to raise awareness about the value of the We can go to a policy and say, hey, this car will reach $10 million for you. Ideally, we keep the develop effective management. Ideally, we keep it to understand how the costs and benefits of different actions are distributed between different stakeholders. We can, in theory, use it to, the, to calculate damages for compensation. So, if something has been damaged, how much do we pay the person to compensate for that? We can, in theory, use it to calculate user fees for access to different environmental use. We can, in theory, also use this to estimate our level of resource extraction. Now, while these are all great reasons to put the benefit of environment into dollars and services, 
what Nadia's uh, presentation just showed us is that there's so many other ways we can do it. And in some ways, these other ways are more valid because they're translating of value into an expression of value in local language that are locally relevant. You know, from a Western standpoint, thinking of things in dollars and cents can make sense. If somebody tells me that this is worth one dollar, I know based on my lifestyle that it takes 10,000 of those dollars to buy an education. So I know the value of this one dollar, right? So if somebody says to me, if I remove this Carl Reese, you'll lose X number of dollars, I can understand that. But what about the person who has been seeing that Carl Reese his entire life? What about the person who uses that Carl Reese as a form of insurance when there's no employment to go and catch fish? So there's so many other types of value that dollar value fails to capture, and it's good to emphasize that dollar value is a truly Western way of doing environmental impact. So this is why I want to talk about how can this food shop come out short. Now we can see all of these, you know, hectares of dried mango. This is a product that we're doing right now, and when you look at the services provided by the mango. People catch abana mangroves, people catch fishing mangroves, people use a mangrove for sustainable wood production, for fish pots, catch lobster. People use the mangroves for honey. In addition to this, this is just local value. The mangroves are very important to people's identity because they're people from the mangrove area. The food that they eat, there's certain Shrimps some cockroaches, but only because of the mangroves that are made into local food, right? So, we could in theory replace the mangrove with a few things, maybe a, a fish nurse, but you'd have to put two fish nurse to replicate the diversity of this mangrove. You could in theory replace this mangrove with something like a water treatment plant, but you'd have to put in multiple water treatment plants to process the water that passes through this area. And then, this, this right now, we're thinking about carbon and climate change and protection. You know, one meter to sea wall costs a lot of money. So you would be spending thousands of dollars to replace this in the sea wall, right? In the face of climate change as well, what some people don't know about mangroves is that, like a regular forest, you know, a regular forest grows, it's capturing carbon from the, from, from the atmosphere. Also, some of the mangroves are trying to sediment soil. They're trapping carbon in that sediment and soil, but also in their roots. So mangroves are very important in terms of the of So I wanted to say, you know, we could begin to put an honor value to a fraction of those things, and we would still be failing the total value of the mangrove, right? This is just one example. It's something that, and I want to make two points here. Ecosystem services is an interdependent increments of Interdependent that they're woven together, right? I could tell you the value of a fish, but to that fisherman, that fish is not ten dollars, ten bolivars, you know, ten whatever. That fish is also part of their identity. So for me to put a value to that fish only as it's treated value to a tourist, I am avoiding so much other value to the fisherman and to his identity. So the question becomes, do I try to measure his identity value in just dollars? It's possible. But trying to separate that from the value of the fish is almost impossible. So you have these two things which are intertwined in terms of people's personal value. Then you have something in commerce ability, right? which is to have no common measure. Right? Um, I'm going to say it in a very brutal way. Right? Um, to some people, trees are sacred. A tree is worth people timber. To some people, it's worth charcoal. To some people, it's worth lumber. Right? Or if that tree is sacred to you, to tell me that that tree is worth ten ten dollars of lumber, it would make no sense to me. You couldn't tell somebody how much the value of the meat of their favorite dog or favorite cat would be. Right? I mean, I could tell you the value of meat, I could tell you the value of proteins, but I cannot tell you the value of my pet as protein. There are two things that are just not possible to measure. 
And the same thing goes for the nature. You know, I could begin to attempt to, to value nature in terms of or our call reef in terms of the medicinal potential or the potential in terms of post protection. In terms of somebody seeing that far reef every day of their life and it forming part of their identity, those are values which can be compared and are what is called income and so what do we do when the approach of putting things in dollar value fails? Well, we have a concept called nature's contribution to people, which tries to extend to beyond just the instrumental values and tries to look at people's relational values with nature. Right? How does nature contribute to my cultural heritage that I have? Why is nature important for environmental justice and ethics? Right? It understands that in parts of values which cannot be detangled, but are also certain values which just cannot be compared. I cannot compare the dollar value of an apple to the sake of value of trees to somebody who is indigenous. So nature's contribution to people tries to go above ecosystem services to consider these things. And as I said, it focuses very much on the relation of values, the relationships that we have to nature, which is some of the things that Nadia began to speak about in terms of what she's documenting. She's documenting, documenting how these young boys are relating to nature, how she is relating to them, and you know, observing that as a use of beautiful art, and also it's meaningful to so many of us, right? You know, and I really like the point that she made that the second she began to put the image of the Calvary in the papers, and people said, hey, somebody else here. There are probably thousands of people before who also cared about this, but because nobody was speaking about it, there was a public voice, they saw the tractor ripping up the car reef and they said, but there's nothing I could do to let it go, and let this pass. In um, behavioral economics, that's something called um, the bystander effect, where you think somebody else is But having somebody else document and import and a report these values was emotional and emotive to people to the point that it got a critical mass to say, hey, this is a problem for us. So this is why saying something is worth $10,000 to commit in is great, but articulating relationship in a locally relevant way is actually more powerful and not a very human-centered, individualistic, almost Western perspective in nature, which does not go with our reality. Nature is not only a commodity for identity. So how can we understand other values? Well, a key part is consultation and participation of communities in the decision-making process. Citizen science and media generation is also critical. The one thing that we've done is that we get people training in how to take photography for um, science journalism, how to take good photography for um, science journalism but also how do these things to document the system's state. The importance of doing these things over time to document change. And you know, you heard Nadia say that she was doing this stuff intuitively, but also it was very useful to her. And something that was not necessarily a legal case, but almost a legal case in the court of public opinion. She was able to show photos showing environmental change, but also the current state of the environment, which was critical to a decision to not be developed, right? So now he's a professional photographer. The fact of the matter is, as she said, there are, hundreds, there are hundreds of other people that jumped to her cause that if they had a cell phone and the right method to document things, they could actually be used as evidence or, um, or as information in broader activism. So we have done this in formal national ecosystem assessment. Um, we have done this in, in smaller evaluation areas, we need to one uh, UNESCO heritage study in uh, Antigua and Barbuda. We train people in doing video interviews, um, and video consultations to capture information about relationships with nature because we did not have time to try to develop these dollar value figures, but also we knew it could be more powerful. So you involve people in the decision making process, you generate some facts like citizen media through training, but also you can conduct focus groups in nature. So traditionally, um, NGOs will invite people to a conference group to conduct a focus group. The best way to conduct a focus group with people who are interacting with nature 
is to go and interact with them in their space. This is something we've been doing a lot. We will go to an area with a big flip chart, with a, a big map, with some photographs of historical uh, imagery of how the area used to be. And we have a conversation to understand environmental problems in local land. Also to understand for the needs, but also research. So there may not be hard literature written down, but the information may be there in people's minds. We just need to go and speak to them in their space so that they're comfortable, but also they can show you the things that matter. And finally, one thing that we've been doing right now with the mangrove is participatory mapping. In this case, you print a giant map to tell people the truth, which is that no expert with the best satellite or best drone could know the area the same way they know the mangroves that they went with children to catch families. The mangroves that they know when the moon comes, certain fish will move into the area and can be caught. The same coral reef that they know protected them from a major hurricane. The fact of the matter is satellite photography is only taken once every year and involving local knowledge is the best way to verify, uh, understand the problems, but also to, uh, to scope and understand where further research needs to be done. You know, the best um, bioprospectors in the world, people who go into nature to look for medicine, they don't just use and take it back to the, the chemistry lab and analyze it. They go and speak to mothers and aunties and uncles and say, what do you use this food for? Do you use it for inflammation? Do you use it for your eye? Because that's the only way they know to do and test this leaf in the laboratory for a specific thing. So doing the map in the area is important um, to have in a spatially explicit way what relationships people have with the environment, what challenges they're facing, how the environment has changed, right? Um, and as Nadia said, that actually documented evidence was very, very useful in actual um, the court of public. Um, I just want to thank you guys, but also emphasize, you know, the power of science education, um, but also activism really cannot be overemphasized. I've been in this for almost 15 years now, when I first started, everyone wanted to put everything in the dollars and figures, and dollars and cents. And now people are beginning to realize that participation and understanding values from local people in their local which is critical, because dollars and cents is only a fraction of a fraction of the value, but also thinking only about dollars and cents have created most of the environmental problems that we face right now. So I just want to thank you all for coming to speak here. Um, I don't know if any questions on the details of how we improve the value, but I'm really happy to, to be able to see that people like Nadia exist in the region because they're the ones who are preventing us from taking the same problem over and over again, but also showing people that it's possible uh, to influence how decisions are made with, uh, with good art uh, and also with good expression of value in our local place. So I'm happy for our voice and I'm happy for platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> yes, I think the idea that you, uh, you know, in, in some way presented in which uh, nature value evaluation depends on the context is really interesting. I think thinking locally is important in order to understand that those Western point of view at, in order to face climate change has to adapt through different scenarios. And Caribbean area has one scenario that is not the same like in Asia or in Africa or even in the United States. So, so I think it's important to understand which are those needs from those communities in which in order to respond or create those policies, and I think you've been involved, involved sorry, 
in the creation of some, some policies uh, around uh, the Caribbean area, I'm thinking in Trinidad and Tobago or Jamaica or Antigua and Barbuda. And, and it will be interesting, I think that's my question for you, to, to let us know uh, if that process, I know, uh, of course, it has a lot of uh, consultation with uh, a lot of agents and actors in the area, but also how that policies come to a life in a way could be impactful uh, to those Icelanders directly. And, and not only, I mean, even when they recognize their needs, how the, retro, uh, the feedback, the feedback <laughs> is in a way um, introduced in changing little by little that approach that is not that Western. It's more tropical Caribbean, <laughs> if I may say so. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I think um, we should. Well, I mean, I, I think it's about always getting our activists, getting our people to, to these platforms to speak um, about these issues and making sure that the framing of these agreements, these big climate change agreements, is not only Western, so it's almost just a trap. It's almost just a foregone conclusion that we're going to already speak in their language and their framework. I think we have to work to fight against these, to, to create alternative platforms where things like art can be used to, to uh, uh, influence decision making. Um, precisely what that's what I can't do with any certainty, but I think that that's the direction that we, we, we have to go. Hmm. Well, if it's another uh, comment or question. Hmm. Yeah, come forward to the mic, please. I just happen to be, let's say, in your country, Cuba. I'm from Aruba, and um, it's very interesting what we've been hearing through, let's say, photography, and especially what these gentlemen do. We have to do now with a lot of young people like you, and it is a pity that we see that all, everybody went. They are not here. We, we have lost people. Um, we didn't know the name of this phenomenon, tsunami. We have a band in Aruba, it's called Tsunami now, but I remember people telling me that in Puerto Rico, if it was not for El Yunque, that would have been gone already. But we have lost some people in, in Thailand, yeah, in Thailand, a couple of years ago in 2004, and then the, the, the eyes were opened. But what we saw in the first, when Nadia was speaking about, let's say, building hotel where she grew up. We are feeling this, and I have two daughters who live abroad, but that's, we, we have in a sense in Aruba. And now it is a kind of collective memory that people are to protect those things. And I remember I didn't, a couple of years ago in Puerto Rico, a lady told me, you're from Aruba, you have beautiful islands, but you should be aware of this, because sooner or later it's going to happen. And she was showing me, let's say, what we lose into the ocean, what can be very filthy. And we have someone in a room of, let's say, a group of divers that every morning they clean the beaches. And I remember as a kid what Nandi was saying, swimming where the first hotel was bought, it is like a kind of swamp and it smells very bad. And all those things of, let's say, copper tone and those things, we should protect not to use these things. On the island of Bonaire, if you come to dive, you bring your batteries, you bring them back with you to your country. You can leave the mess on the island. And that, that is, let's say, a global thing that we should be aware of because they are protective laws. But we see from, let's say, the young that they are demanding the politicians in order to be aware of this because you can lose it very, uh, uh, let's say, easy, and it is due to what do we want with the tourism. It's great, but we should be very aware in order to do this. This is my comment, and I, I, I let's say, I listened, and I supposed to go right if I said, no, let me get into this, and uh, I'm very glad to hear this. Um, the concern about, let's say, them, 
and advocate to have other people in order, let's say, you can have welfare, you can have, let's say, modern things, people coming, but the same thing, and the education of field, I remember Teresita Santiago in Puerto Rico taking the kids to the beach in order to take samples of the water in order to see the damage that we are contributed to this and to hold it. That is my comment and congratulations for all of you. Que Dios me le bendiga y gracias. Lo quería hacer en español, pero me obligaron a, a cambiar de idioma. Wow. Bendición a Cuba. Any other question or comment? Well, thank you very much, both of you, the speakers, and we are really welcome for, for you to have a, this afternoon to share with us your thoughts and mostly your knowledge, which is always welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm, I'm Sandra, not in Cuba, but uh, hopefully next time you will be. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye. All right, great. Thank you so much, everybody. To you.